Good morning. I'm Sylvia Carmen Covina, Executive Director of the BAS, and I want to give you a warm welcome this morning. Welcome back to Miami Beach. We're so happy to have you here. So before we begin, I'd like to thank the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, who support the Curator Culture Series. And I'd like to introduce our Curator of Public Programs, Tom Healy. Thank you, Sylvia. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so at the very end of the philosophy of Andy Warhol from A to Z and back again, Warhol tells the story of going to Macy's to buy underwear. It's a bit of a long story, but after the underwear, Andy and a friend end up going to look at some jewelry. Of course, Warhol gets bored and says, let's go buy some Dr. Scholl's for his feet. His friend, and he are bickering, the friend wants to have the jewelry instead, and Andy whines, why? And his friend says, because diamonds are forever. And Andy says, and this ends the book, forever what? Forever what? I hope you had your copy, because I'm going to start with a little philosophy this morning. And if you studied Philosophy 101, you know this passage from Nietzsche, where he says, what if some day or night a demon was to steal after you in your loneliest loneliness and say, the life as you now live it and have lived, and the life you're going to have once more and innumerable times forward. There'll be nothing new, every pain, every joy, every thought, everything unutterably small or great in your life will have to return to you in the same succession and sequence over and over. Even the spider, even the trees, even this moment, the eternal hourglass of existence will be turned upside down again and again, and you a speck of dust in it. Well, Nietzsche thought the first thing we'd probably think about that endless recurrence was, wow, that sucks. But then he wondered, what if life goes round and round forever, meaning we'd better step up and make it good, and be our best selves, be honest, dangerous, live more experimentally, be brave, and amp things up? Well, Peter Saul and Mike Winkleman, we have two artists on stage who definitely amp things up. They hold a mirror to the mayhem and mania, our stupidity, greed, our lust and lying, but also our fun, awe and love. They reflect back at us, not the, the not at all divine comedy of every day in their cartoon color and weirdness. Where does it go? What form does that forever take? In another famous moment in Andy's philosophy, he writes that during the hippie era, people put down the idea of business. They'd say money is bad, working is bad. But I think making money is art, and working is art, and good business is the best art. Let's see about it. And the man gathering us on this is someone who knows art and money and lots of hard work, the collector, gallerist, critic, and best-selling author, Adam Lindemann. Take it away. Thank you so much, Tom. And I just want to applause a little longer for my friend Peter Saul, an artist I respect, whose work I love, whose work I've known my entire life from childhood on. And getting to know Peter has been a real honor and something I've just enjoyed. And thank you for being here, Peter. You're quite welcome. Glad to be here. <laughs> Mike is a new friend, uh, an artist whose work I've really, uh, I dove in and I went way into the rabbit hole. I have further to go. Mike, thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you for helping me understand the world that you're in and the place that you're coming from and helping me think about where our art world could go, will go, and will end up. So thank you for being here. Mike. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I generous. appreciate you putting this together and everybody coming. <laughs> um, I want to thank the Bath Museum, Sylvia Kubina. Thank you, Sylvia. Tom for inviting us, the Knight Foundation for having us, and um, I want to thank my brother, who's the chairman of this fine establishment, for also uh, supporting this. And I just want you all to know that I have a lot of family here. There's some people from the best museums in the world, people that I really admire and respect, 
and many friends and many people are interested in what this conversation, where it's going. So thank you for participating. Um, I guess I'll tell a little story. When I was growing up, I had a friend whose father was an art dealer. This man was called Alan Frumpkin, and Alan Frumpkin's house was filled with Peter Sauls. So as a 12-year-old kid, I'd go to this house and see these crazy, twisting paintings and wondering, oh my god, my parents would never have something like that at home. This man is really an eccentric. And then I sort of got more and more into it. And, um, and so I've admired Peter's work for, for, since that time. And I had the honor of and the pleasure of showing Alan Frumpkin's Peter Saul collection. That's how this relationship began. And last summer, I was out in Long Island at the beach. And my friend, who's here in the room, a very famous Swiss art dealer, said, I have people here. You want to meet people? I'm like, do I want to meet people? <laughs> Are you kidding? Bring them over right now. <laughs> and uh, Mike and I were talking, and I was li more, more listening than talking, fortunately, which is hard for me to do, a little self-control. <laughs> and um, I had this beautiful painting of Peters on the wall called Women's Arts, total masterpiece from the 80s right over the mantle. And I said, Mike, you're an artist, but you're also someone who appreciates art. What do you think of this? He's like, wow, I really like that painting. And look at this retrospective that Peter just had at the New Museum. Take the book with you. And so when I saw Mike's eyes look at Peter's work, and I thought about the digital world, the world of painting, I saw this connection, and we kind of put this connection somehow on these screens that um, both of you have worked with celebrity. Both of you have spoken about politics, contemporary events, war, crime, theft, sexism, racism, money, the art world. And so I think that contrary, like people want to think NFT or painting, but in reality, I think you both have many things in your dialogues, in your communication in common. And to me, I'm less interested in talking about what is an NFT, which is something we can all read up on study, rather than talking about art. So this conversation is really about art, not about money. We're gonna leave the art fair behind, and we're gonna talk about what does an artist have to contribute to our world. I have seven questions for each one of you. And so um, sure. you, you've both been briefed. And you both had the questions in advance. I know you've studied them well. So, um, <laughs> I don't remember you sending these questions. I've forgotten all about it after that. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Do it now. So, <laughs> Peter, how and why did you start making art? Uh, well, I was deeply hostile and, and angry as a little kid. And I just thought it would be something I could do by myself. And it worked. And I just kept doing it for my whole life. And I started. I just, I just plain started. It was 1947, I was 12 and a half years old or something like that, and my mom gave me a little box of paints and I just started painting. And when I grew up, a few years later, when I was forced to face the world, I just decided I didn't want to go any place and get told what to do by anyone on a regular basis, which means I could have no legal employment, could have no anything. So I just chose to be an artist based on uh, reading Life magazine and seeing the life of Picasso and Matisse and seeing, hey, these guys use their imagination, I'll use my imagination. So in 1951, I told my parents that and they, they, they sent me to an art school of their choice and uh, I skipped the commercial art, but I, I, I did the the other art classes, so I've had normal art schooling, and I just kept going. Great. Mike, how and why did you start making art? <laughs> this is an um, interesting question. I didn't know we were going to go so deep into it right away. I thought there was going to be a few softballs, and we could kind of <laughs> bat it around. Um, honestly, it wasn't really similar, a, a kind of super conscious effort. I actually went to school for computer science, and sort of, as soon as I got to school, I started creating, making little digital art with the, like the webcam that I had attached to my computer. Like, and so I could only move it as far as the cord went, which was like you know a one foot radius. And I would make these like weird little videos, and I just kept doing more and more of that, and realized sort of halfway through 
college that I didn't really want to be a programmer and I just wanted to make this digital art and, and just, if I could just get a job doing anything, I didn't really give a shit. I just wanted to like uh, put all of my sort of like time and energy into making this art that, again, up until very recently, there was no way to collect. It was just something that I had to do and just like loved doing and, and was always interested in making. Great, thank you. And uh, this one will be interesting for all of us. Peter, how and why did you choose your medium? Well, my medium chose me. <laughs> Actually, when I decided I wanted to be an artist, there was nothing going on but the abstract expressionist art movement. It was in all the magazines and you know things were happening with those people. And I, it just never occurred to me to question the media. I just thought, hey, if I can do this, I can stay home all day <laughs> and lounge and have a good time with myself and my own life. And, and that's, that's all I ever thought. And I didn't have a lot of thought for art medium. Mike, no uh, painting? No, no, honestly. So like by the t when we were in, I believe I was in fifth grade, we got a computer. Um, and this was obviously, this was probably 1992, 1993. And so from that moment on, like I was just very drawn to the computer and always sort of like saw this as a, kind of like a great sort of like equalizer that it's sort of like, just like with like a brush, what can this person do with a brush and canvas? I saw that as the computer being very much the same way. What can this person do with a, a computer versus what could I do with the computer? And, and I saw that as something that was even back then very sort of democratizing uh, a tool that could really sort of, you know, one person in their bedroom can, has done quite a bit to change the world with like just a computer. And so I was always sort of like focused on making things with that sort of like tool. Hmm. Peter, this is really something that came to mind and I, I see the two of you really <laughs> talking the same language here. You have chosen to depict current events Politicians, like we have quite a few Donald Trumps here on these screens. Billionaires, um, mostly villains. Yes. Stalin and many others. I only do bad guys. <laughs> this connects you to figuration and counterculture. Are you comfortable with this? Totally, totally. I mean, the art world did me a great good turn. It gave me a role to play, and I've played it ever since the absolute, since 19... 62, mid-1962, mid, mid when I suddenly discovered I was a bad pop artist. <laughs> yeah, there was all these good pop artists like Lichtenstein and Rosenquist and so on, and it was a bad one, Peter Saul. He's, and so I thought, hey, that's my rule. I'm the bad guy. And so I just ever since made the bad art, and it's been great. It, it was a role to play. I've enjoyed it immensely, and it's worked perfectly. There you go, there it is. <laughs> Mike, I don't think it's question a, again? I don't think it's worked as perfectly for me, being the bad guy. Um, but no, I think like putting, uh, and, and this is honestly much more recent for me uh, with the work that I've done. Um, again, the work that I've created over, over the last 20 years, most of it is not political. That's really just been the last sort of maybe year and a half, two years, but I think, I, I do like watch a lot of news and, and read a lot of news and that's like a huge sort of like influence in my work, you know, sort of lately. I think the things going on now, it's sort of like, it's hard to ignore the amount of just general fucking craziness. And, and so, um, you know, it, it's because it is such a big part of sort of like what I'm taking in is like the inspiration It obviously kind of comes out in the work, but I think it's one of these things where uh, I think that is part of sort of the role of the artist to kind of like take and sort of like recontextualize these crazy events and sort of like, in my case, try to bring up more sort of like questions around this stuff than like answers and not trying to sort of like have a super strong message, although sometimes there is more of a very direct message, but most of the time I'm trying more to sort of just pose questions around these sort of topics. Thank you. Peter, this is, this, this is a tougher one. You've persevered with your artistic practice 
with little money or recognition for many years. Now, you've always been known, but I don't think that people have given you uh, as much respect as you, in my opinion, you were always due. What gave you the drive to persevere? Well, I was never looking for respect or art appreciation. And I always had enough money. Believe it or not, I have the type of personality that art dealers like to be kind to. <laughs> and I started with the first one, Alan Frumpkin, and continuing with this one right here. I've had no problems, financial problems at all. I live comfortably. <laughs> Like you, went a, a long time you never sold anything, and you kept making art for many, many years. Yeah, uh, honestly, that was just not on my radar as like a part of art to me. It was always just like this thing that I just created, and it, I will say it was sort of bringing in better freelance work. It was sort of like almost like advertising that I could do these things, and and sort of so I was continuing to sort of like reap the benefits of the work, even though I wasn't directly sort of like selling it and people weren't collecting it. Um, and so, uh, again, I sort of was living very simply and sort of like, you know, always had enough money and always had like a, a sort of like full-time job that was sort of like paying the bills as well. So that to me allowed me to just kind of make whatever the hell I wanted without thought of like, is somebody gonna buy this? Is somebody gonna collect this? And so I definitely feel very lucky to have sort of been able to do that for a very long time and sort of had money be no real like part of the equation like literally at all for the first roughly sort of like 20 years. But here's a little NFT thing I'll put in for people who are curious about it. Just continuing with that, until the existence, until the innovation that was the NFT, you had no way to sell your art. Well, you, and that's not technically true in a way. I could have done like prints and stuff, but honestly, nobody really did that. And I wasn't really that excited about it. I just wasn't looking at it as something to be sort of like collected. And so it was never, I just wasn't thinking about that. So I could have done prints, but it just didn't connect with people or myself in the way that like NFTs did. NFTs just feels like a more natural sort of like medium for this work. And I think it presents, especially with sort of being able to like program the NFTs and sort of like have them change and update, I think it presents new as a canvas like ways of sort of like looking at, at sort of like digital art as well. Peter, thank you. Peter, your first supporters and patrons, how did they find you? Oh, oh my first, you mean? Well, okay. your first collectors, your first... Well, I never met hardly any collector, period. I, I met Alan Frumkin, the art dealer, after a lot of struggle in Paris, France, won't go into it. But uh, I, I've never met more than... I mean, I'm 87, and I haven't met more than seven or eight art collectors in my whole life, quite frankly. I just did, didn't seek them out, and they didn't seek me out, and I have no idea what was going on at any level. <laughs> Mike, who are your collectors and how did they find you? They found you and they, they have lavished many, many ether on you in many different iterations. Um, yeah, so, and that's the thing that I think a lot of people maybe don't recognize just because it, it appears that I can't kind of came out of nowhere to this sort of like spot, but I had like a bunch of sort of like following on social media that kind of like, as soon as I started selling NFTs, like immediately people, there was already kind of like a built-in audience and it was an audience that I'd never really sold anything to. And so they were, they seemed pretty primed to buy stuff. Um, but it was just something where it was just sort of like, I kind of innately was always sort of like recognizing if I could within, respect to social media, if I could sort of keep people's attention, maybe there might be sort of like a way to sort of like, I don't know, it just, it, it was, I, I sort of recognize that that is kind of what will sort of like eventually lead to continued sort of like success is just sort of like ex putting my work out through social media. Um, and so people, you know, were able to like find me through that and continue to sort of like find me through, you know, just putting out work each day. 
But this only happened in the last two years, let's say, two or three years, the explosion of the NFT, and yet you very quickly understood how to give work away and create additions, and how did you figure that out? So the, kind of as soon as, and, and how I came to NFTs is the, the kind of like fans that I had kind of kept coming to me and sort of like bugging me and like, you gotta check this out, and sort of like, you know, I think this is, you know, will be good, and so as soon as it kind of like clicked for me, I really went, sort of heads down, but in terms of like giving the like NFTs away, because when I first sort of like the first drop, and I've done this a bunch of times, I've sort of given a bunch of artwork for like a dollar. And you know, now those things are worth whatever, but it's sort of like giving back like that is something that I've honestly always done. And like a lot of my project files are like free that I've sort of like would make a short film and then the project file honestly is kind of of no use to me because I've already sort of like rendered out the final product. It's almost like a used like brush. And so it's sort of, um, you know, but it can kind of help teach other people how this was actually made. And so I would give those away and I've been giving those away for, you know, a decade. And also like visuals, concert visuals. I've got like literally hundreds of concert visuals that again I was giving away and sort of like that was sort of bringing in more work as people sort of saw those and like, you know, use those. Um, and so, sort of, I, I always throughout the, my kind of career realized that like just giving things out and sort of blindly providing value for other people will always like return tenfold, like kind of like back to you. Mm -hmm. Generous, <laughs> Peter. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now that you are globally famous, I remember you saying that you walk down the street and people ask you for your autograph now or want to take their picture with you. happened twice, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're globally famous in my mind. Okay, that's good. <laughs> He's the art dealer. <laughs> How has it changed your work? Um, I'm trying to not let it change my work, really. I, I make a certain amount of effort. Uh, when Jackson Pollock, here you go, here's the story. When Jackson Pollock was in Life Magazine, I remember quite well that event. I was already painting. I'd been painting about a year or two. And uh, his work was extremely upsetting to the whole country, believe it or not, because Life Magazine, which was very important before TV was widespread, which wasn't until about 1950. Anyway, during this time, People were very upset by Jackson Pollock being in Life magazine because it didn't seem like honest work. They had previously shown the work of famous artists from Europe or um, decent American art, you know, Reginald Marsh and so on. People, Andrew Wyeth, people who paint pictures. And this upset people, Jackson Pollock, very much. And so I got the idea that in order to be famous or to be, live as an artist, you had to cause some trouble in the art world. And that probably started me on the uh, track that I'm on right now. And that's the reason I do things that I do. I didn't give it a lot of thought. Did I answer the question? I forgot the, <laughs> I've forgotten the question. Thank you, Peter. We'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, how has now being Beeple. I mean, you went to that thing during the crypt NFT week two weeks ago in New York, that huge party that Metacoven had where he exhibited your work, and I heard you needed security, and people were trying to get close to you and touch you. <laughs> okay, that, that sounds, and people were trying to touch you. That's, I think, maybe characterizing it a little weird. Um, <laughs> But it's true, you are really globally famous. How will that affect you? Um, well, that remains to be seen. That remains to be seen. But I think, honestly, sort of, again, there was some level of dork fame before this. Um, and definitely not to this level. I will say definitely not to this level. But um, I don't know. I, I think it's one of those things. <laughs> Again, it's pretty easy because I, I live in Charleston and kind of like nobody in Charleston gives a fuck, to be quite honest. Like, they don't give a shit. And so it's, it's not like you come out to these things, but like as soon as I leave, I mean, I could walk across the street. Nobody knows who the fuck I am. Like, it's, it's very sort of like localized to kind of like, you know, certain events. It's, it's 
pretty easy to turn off though, I guess, and kind of just sort of, you know, go back and do my own thing and sort of, um, I, I don't know. It doesn't, I don't think it will have that much of a, a sort of effect because it's, it's just, it, it kind of, it is what it is and it's fun and I love doing like events and stuff like this and, you know, talking and meeting people. So to me, it, it's just another sort of like, honestly, kind of perk or sort of like, you know, plus of like being in this position. But it did change your work with the work that you just uh, showed at Christie's when you created the walking spaceman and suddenly you're investing in hardware, you're creating a physical object that demonstrates the work. So you have the NFT, but you also have the physical. Yeah, I think that is something that, um, you know, th this sort of like collecting and sort of like people sort of, you know, viewing the work that I do as capital A art versus, you know, sort of digital art, I think is, is something that has definitely changed the work that I'm doing and like sort of making physical pieces like that is not something that I was literally thinking about at all, you know, before NFTs. It was always sort of like, what can I do on the computer, like purely digital. And, but to me, that's like, oh, sorry, super, super exciting. Like that is, is really something that I'm most excited about and I think is very ironic that everybody from this world is suddenly being forced in the, or not forced, but sort of exposed to the digital realm and, and sort of like, I'm kind of, you know, being, going in the other direction and sort of like starting to, to make physical works. And I think you're really just gonna see a sort of like blending of those two worlds, which to me is, is super exciting and I think something we're just really at the very, very beginnings of. And it's interesting to me that that's a focus for you because someone else who's strictly a digital artist might not feel that need to participate in the museum world, to participate in this art world. I don't really see it as like a need to participate. It's honestly more just like I want to. It's just like now these things and sort of, you know, honestly, the, the things that I'm doing now, like it just were not possible before because they cost, you know, quite a bit of money to like just physically make. And so it wasn't even like something that was really even uh, sort of like an option. And so now that it is like, holy shit, I can make all this shit and I can like, you know, have these crazy things produced. Like it, to me, it's like super inspiring and just like so fun to be able to sort of like manifest these things in the real world. Great. So this is the last question. And I think that Peter, this is a very forward thinking question, but you are part of the future uh, because you'll be around forever. And um, Mike, you are going to tell us something about the future. But the question is, how will museums evolve when they were designed for paintings and sculptures in a world that is becoming digital and virtual? Uh, well, OK, my turn. All right. I, I, I think it might not survive, quite frankly. It's been announced as dead a number of times since I've been alive painting. So if it were to continue, I think it would have to give something more than it's giving right now. And I think that thing that it needs to give is psychology, particularly psychology that can't be done on the more expensive, widespread ways because they're too expensive, quite frankly. I mean, you can't make a movie about something that is unpopular. People won't go see it, so that's the end of that movie. But you can paint a picture and it doesn't matter whether anybody agrees with you. You get to do it. You've done it all by yourself. I have a room called a studio, and I simply go there and I do it. There's nobody helps me to do it. Nobody advises me what to do, and nobody criticizes me when I've done it. It's simply someone comes and takes it away and maybe hopes for the best, you know, that there's a collector. But I think that painting will continue on this level. I think painting will hang out as long as people can give something psychologically that can't be done in more expensive ways. I mean, my most expensive painting only cost me $1,000 to make, and that is, is including $500 for the stretcher bars. So I mean, <laughs> we've got no big problem, you know what I mean? I can do it. <laughs> Mike? Okay. Thank you, Peter, and uh, I like what you're saying. Thank you for that. Mike, this, this one, how will museums evolve when they're designed for paintings and sculptures through no fault of their own? That's what we had. 
And now, what will happen in this digital virtual world? Um, I think museums will definitely, I personally think they'll 100% sort of like evolve and sort of like continue to sort of like interest people because I think the sort of need for curation and the need for context, people to sort of like take work and sort of like add context to it, that's not going to sort of like change and that will be necessary with digital art just the same as it's necessary with, you know, paintings and sculptures. I think you know, the rooms might change and you might have video screens on the walls or projectors or this or that, but I think it's something that, um, you know, uh, obviously I think museums have continued to evolve over the years to sort of like fit the needs of society and I think you're just gonna continue to see that happen with, with digital work because again, it's sort of, it's a new medium, but it still has the same sort of like message and intent and sort of like craft and nuance as any of these other mediums. Um, and so I, I don't think, you know, museums should be worried or scared about this. I think it's just gonna be another room in the museum that sort of like has this type of work. And I think paintings and, and physical works like that, I think those will continue to be something that are, are very much cherished by society because that's where this stuff came from. Like, the, the things that I do would not have been sort of like possible without, you know, people sort of like coming before and doing things that, that um, you know, inspired the, the people like me. Thank you, I appreciate that. Tom, what do you say we do some questions? Sure, I actually have one since I have the mic, so I actually want to follow up on that uh, museum question. And Mike, on the bottom of uh, the collecting page of your website, in very tiny print. I'm going to paraphrase this, but it says, I'm going to keep on working until I get into the MoMA, and I'm going to keep on working until I get kicked out of the MoMA. <laughs> Can you elaborate a little on that goal? I like the goal. Um, well, obviously, I think the goal of getting into the MoMA is fairly self-explanatory, but then I feel like you need to keep pushing. Uh, and sort of like keep people sort of on their toes in terms of um, maybe hearing messages that they don't want to hear and sort of, um, I don't know, just continuing to ruffle feathers, I guess, uh, is, is something that I think is, um, to me, interesting about art, is that you can, I feel like you can get away with a lot of stuff, and then you're just like, it's art. And then like, people are kind of like, <laughs> there's a different set of sort of like expectations, and you can kind of say things that maybe you couldn't normally say otherwise. Peter, could you follow up on that too? Of, uh, Golly, uh, uh, ask me the question again. The, the goal of being kicked out of a museum, of doing oh, yeah, something okay. that's... okay, well, I, I, I've had very little to do with museums. I, I leave them alone and let them <laughs> do their thing, quite frankly. I've had a couple of museum shows, two or three, and, and I just found the best thing to do was smile at them, you know, <laughs> if you ever meet them, and because you can't do anything about it. They're just going to do what they're going to do, and I, that's it. That's it. So we have a time for a few questions. If you raise your hand, we'll bring some mics around right here. Thank you. Um, Mike, I was curious what you said about NFTs providing depth uh, in terms of your canvas as an artist and providing you the ability to explore in different realms and in different ways. Can you, that's quite an interesting and new thing as an artist. So can you talk a little bit about what those possibilities are and how you see that evolving? Yeah, I think honestly the way that NFTs have been used in the almost all of the sort of like use cases of them thus far have been where it's just sort of like a, a canvas that is very, very similar to a regular canvas and that you sort of put something in it and it never changes and that's it. The 5,000 days piece that, you know, sold at Christie's in March, that's never gonna change. It's a static work that is like sort of done and finished, similar to sort of like a painting. But NFTs, because they can sort of be programmed and have sort of different, um, they can be sort of dynamic. And so that allows with sort of, you know, that's something we explored with Human One where it's, it will continue to change and evolve over the course of my lifetime. It's not done. 
it sold, and a collector you know, sort of now has that, but I'm going to continue to change that work. And I think that is fundamentally quite different than sort of um, traditional artwork in the past, but I think that's something that you're going to see much more of in the future, and I think that is what I believe will sort of like be kind of like the future of like art, that you'll have things in your house that change based on the artist wanting to change it or change based on different criteria. And I think um, you're gonna see people to continue to sort of use that dynamic nature to this um, in really new and interesting ways. Here we go, right here. Um, hi, um, I just wanted to touch on something you said earlier. How important, if at all, do you think it is for um, the crypto art movement to have some kind of academic writing in the same way as the traditional art? And um, how is that going to happen? And do you think that's going to happen soon? And if so, how? Um, I definitely think it is. Because I think the, the sort of, to me, I look at, in terms of the kind of definition of these things, I look at sort of crypto art as being a sort of subset of digital art, and obviously digital art being a, a one sort of like category of like art. Um, and so crypto art is, is, to me, again, like I only learned of, of sort of the NFT stuff a year ago, but I've been making digital art for 20 years. So I think even more than sort of the history of like crypto art, I think the sort of like history of digital art and sort of like how we got to the, the point that we're at, why my work looks like it does, because again, I was influenced by you know, digital artists in you know, 15 years ago and like the things they were doing and sort of like generative art. Generative art has been around for 20 years. I was, when I was in college, I was following people like Joshua Davis who were making <coughs> art with Flash back then. Um, and so I think sort of understanding that history will definitely happen. It's very necessary, you know, just like with any other sort of like art form. Um, and so who's gonna do that? I don't know, but definitely somebody will do that. All right, one, one last question from that side of the room. Let me give you the mic. We'll take a question for, for Peter. Oh, let me you think of something. Well, it's okay. <laughs> Yak <Yeah>, away. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I do want to ask you a question, Mike. I am a fellow Charlestonian, love that area, and um, huge fan. But I heard you do a talk in a, on Twitter with Crazy Carl a little while ago, and you mentioned something about creating some sort of physical something in Charleston relating to, to art. Um, and I haven't been able to find anything on it. I was wondering if you could kind of comment on that and maybe give us an idea of what you were doing there. Yeah, so the, the sort of space that we have, we've got like a, a sort of like big warehouse in Charleston that's like 50,000 square feet and has a bunch of offices and stuff. And so we're building like a gallery there um, that will sort of be a place where you can kind of like learn about like the work that I've done over the last 20 years and also sort of like showcase other sort of like digital artists as well. So. It should be done sometime in like spring, but yeah, that's kind of. So let's have the last word for you, Peter. I'm back here. Oh, okay. <laughs> is there an NFT in your future? Uh, no, not at all. The fact is, uh, I like the system where you think of an idea and you make a little drawing, which somehow is the image of this idea, and then you transfer it to the canvas by means of squaring off. This is like 14th century or something. And then you uh, paint it. It's as simple as that. It's just me doing this. Uh, I think good ideas are ready to be done on canvas. Uh, yeah, yeah. My most recent is uh, teaching a horse to smoke a cigarette, which illustrates man's stupidity <laughs> in the face of nature. And my next one is me fighting abstraction. I put on the gloves and the shorts, and I duke it out with abstraction, who is also wearing shorts and also hitting me. This is a painting. And anyway, a previous painting, I had Superman versus God, because they're both big shots from outer space. These are ideas that I can paint, and so I'm going to keep doing them. I don't see any reason to get involved with technique. 
the paints I use, 105 golden um, heavy body and 3540 stay wet types are all I need. And I, I, I can do it with these paints. And it takes about a month, a month and a half to do a picture. And I'm just not interested in improvement, quite frankly. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. Adam, would you... We have a question from my friend Ronnie Heyman right here. Oh, Ronnie. That's me. There you are, Ronnie. <laughs> I know, it's uh, off-putting. I'm a girl. <laughs> um, I just wanted to pick up on something we said at the beginning of this talk, and it's something Mike said about democratization of art uh, with NFTs. It, it is going to spawn, I think, a whole new system of laws around around this because as you describe, you know, I saw your work at Christie's and I know it's going to change when you want it to change, um, but the whole idea of creating partnerships between artists going forward because there, there is participation in future sales and of course the collector who bought um, the um, the piece at Christie's is actually entering into not only a um, financial partnership with you, but also the dynamism of your mind. I mean, you're going to be playing in the head of the person who... Sure. And I find this fascinating, and I think a whole... Um, system of law will, will be generated by this, you know, how it's governed. And I wondered if you'd cuss, you know, comment on that. Honestly, there's, I can tell you it is wild west with the entire NFT space and there is, because again, it's so new, there definitely needs to be a lot more laws, uh, to be quite honest. It ne definitely needs, um, and it will have, you know, more sort of like oversight and kind of like regulation. But I think, yeah, that it does present a new sort of like, wait a second, like, because again, I could change it to something that that collector might not like. And it's sort of like, that's, you're taking a chance. But I think that's really cool and sort of like something where, um, you know, people can add, it just changes the relationship in a way that I think is really interesting and I think people are gonna play with that in a lot of different interesting ways now that that's a so possibility. We, we had a little of it before without the NFTs and Bitcoin and so on when a sculptor would have to approve where a, a collector um, mm. displays the work. I mean, Richard sure. Sarah has that. So. That's like a toe in the water, but this is really huge. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like, he might have sort of been able to say, okay, I don't want it here, I do want it here, but like, he probably doesn't have the right to go change it completely. And, and that's what I think is, is really interesting with this. And I think um, I'm super excited about it because to be quite honest, I don't know how I'm gonna change it. Because I, I, I know I'm gonna keep changing it, but it's not one of these things where it's like I sort of have the next, you know, 30 years, whatever, of this planned out. And to me, being along for that journey, just the same as the collector, is really, really exciting. And, and I think you're gonna see something that a bunch more artists sort of like play with. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, I'm an artist myself, my name's Naru, and I got two questions, one for you and one for you, Peter. Um, Peter, have you ever used trauma to inspire you to make art? Drama? Trauma. Trauma, oh, uh, yeah, but I, I exaggerated enormously. I, I believe in exaggeration in the attempt to be interesting. So what I do is, if anything happens to me, I mean, if I were to spill a bowl of soup, that might end up as World War III. <laughs> Thank you. Could be. And uh, for you, Mike, who was the first artist that actually inspired you to continue what you're doing today? Um, that is a good question. Honestly, I feel like I'm inspired by like a whole huge amount of artists. I feel like there's not really sort of like one kind of like person who's sort of um, 
I don't know, taking an outsized role in that. I, I am, like everybody else, just inundated with, with you know, sort of the amount of amazing art there is out there. Um, and, and I think my work in particular is really sort of a, a big mix of a lot of different people. Thank you very much. Adam, you want to have a little last word for us? And we'll wrap uh, it up. Well, I mean, I just want to thank Peter and Mike again for being here, and the Knight Foundation, and the Bass, and Sylvia Kubina. Thank you, Sylvia, wherever you are. And thanks for coming. See you at the fair.